scattered around the world's megalithic sites, we see a lot of shared features, and one of the more popular ones in the Atlantis hunting community is known as stone nubs. Now, these protrusions on large rocks that are frequently removed when the stones are finished, but like in the case of Mankari's pyramid, if they leave us some unfinished stones, we can tell that this is something that they used. Now, this often shows up almost always, in fact, with those joints in the rocks. It's paper, like you can't fit a piece of paper in between them. It's just like extremely exacting stonework. So this is a subject of a lot of speculation in the alternate history community, and there's a ton of hypotheses around there. And Well, I have one too, and of course, I think mine's better than everybody else. As a matter of fact, to be honest with you, I think I might have cracked a code here. So if you'll uh, give me a few minutes of your time, we'll uh, see if I'm crazy or if um, I'm not so crazy. Hi, I'm Dan, and welcome to Dedunking. Now, I won't be talking about nubs that are so large and flat that they could serve as a shelf or a place to support a piece of lumber or something like that. I'm talking about the ones that are enigmatic, that, that don't look to serve any sort of purpose, period. They're just some weird natural bit of stone on an otherwise finished piece of stone. Those are the ones that I'm going to be focusing on here. They have a few different hypotheses around them. One of them, that until recently, was my preferred one, and I still think this may have something to do with it, is ropes. Um, this is obviously we keep ropes from walking if you're dragging it, or you know it's a place to secure rigging. But there is a problem, is that if you were like making a net or something to hold these with, unless you place those nubs at the same spot on every single rock, you're not going to really be able to use them on every single rock the same. You're going to have to make new nets. So it would seem like you would see them on the exact same place, which is not what we see. Now, another hypothesis involves the use of geopolymers. Basically, they had a way to liquefy the stone, and then they used electricity to harden the stone after pouring it into molds. And according to this hypothesis, the nubs are a place where electrodes were attached or the electricity would pass through. And I personally find this hypothesis not very good. Um, it violates both like geological principles and electromagnetic principles. So um, to be frank about it, this one, in my opinion, is pure woo. And, of course, there's the stone nub language hypothesis that is basically that these were a way to communicate some esoteric hidden language with just some elites or people that knew the tongue. And while I find this one a little bit outlandish, I will admit that it's not unrealistic. We have seen this kind of thing before. Hell, Stanley Kubrick hid crap in movies to people to find, right? It's not unrealistic for somebody to have done something like this, although I do think it's a bit of a stretch. In my opinion... It's important to look at the sites that these show up at, like I mentioned earlier, at the precision levels of stonework that we see. That's the first thing that is a clue, in my opinion, as to why we have those nubs. The cyclopean architecture we frequently see at the sites that have these nubs betrays not only the extreme levels of planning that was involved, but the massive amount of labor that went into it. Probably thousands of man hours before some of these larger ones were fully installed. And that should be kept in mind when we're evaluating techniques to get there. Tediousness was not that big of a deal. For those of you who make videos, think about editing and filming and all that, how much time you'll put into making a video. These guys were way less time. They didn't have a, an episode of Friends to get back to or whatever. I give away my age there. <clears throat> but anyway, not only should we keep that in mind when we're evaluating these techniques, but we also need to remember that these guys had to have a amazing ways not just to plan, but to implement those plans. Think about these massive walls that are polygonal masonry with like 20 ton stones on each one with 12 sides each. This, the planning that went into this had to be really good. I don't see them picking up the rocks. Wow, damn it. All right, put that back down, shave two inches. No, 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 no. That ain't, that ain't how this worked at all. This, this was planned and executed. First time. If, if they had to do it twice, I bet somebody was stuck on the altar and had their heart ripped out. So each crew probably treated these stones as a work of art, more or less, on their own. And each one of these stones, well, as you can see in these polygonal masonry things, they were treated individually, very carefully individually. Now, the smooth edges can be achieved by lapping. That's where you rub two stones together and eventually you get literally a precision flat surface that you can't fit a piece of paper between the two of them. So that's where that part of it came from. But it doesn't explain how you picked up that rock and put it into that negative space the first time and made it fit so perfectly. That requires it being measured on the ground. And back in those days, that's a tall order, man. They didn't have tape measures or lasers or any of the crap that we would use to measure big things like that so perfectly. So how did they do it? Well, this has long been attributed to like master craftsmen, but I would have to say that that's only part of the equation. It's going to take master craftsmen, absolutely. But they're also going to have to have some really good tools. I mean, you can only do so much without the appropriate tools. And that's where the stone nubs come into this whole thing. In ancient Rome, Greek statues were all the rage. And when they ran out of originals that were affordable, reproductions became like the big deal. 
And this is where we get the first record of 3D graphing and uh, gridding of statues being done. And they did this in a lot of different ways, uh, compass, calipers, cage of wood even, a framework of wood, all kinds of different things were used in order to accurately map each individual portion of the statue to plot it out and then to transfer that onto something else. Now this technique was perfected in the Renaissance with a machine that's known as the pointing machine. It's not really a machine, but they call it a pointing machine. And uh, here's a clip of a guy who knows a lot more about that stuff than I do. I think a lot of sculptors out there are familiar with what the pointing machine does. It transfers points in space, uh, usually off the surface of a model like a plaster cast, and then locates those points relative to other points inside a block of marble. It's a very simple device. It's literally just a needle, a steel needle, that slides back and forth on a sidearm, and that sidearm is connected to a couple joints that make it sort of very mobile and maneuverable. But the needle and the adjustable sidearm are really just half of the setup you need. What you also need is what's called a croce, or crosswood. And basically, that's just a tripod. And it sits on the sculpture in a very particular way. There are actually three nails coming out of the sculpture itself with little holes drilled in the head so that the tripod sits very, very snugly and without any wiggle movement onto the sculpture each and every time. You can pick the crosswood up and put it back down, and it's going to stay in exactly the same place. So this way it can be picked up and put back as many times as you need as long as you make sure that that framework doesn't move around and your reference points don't move around. If those two things stay the same, you can pick that up, put it back down, pick that up, put it back down as many times as you need to. And it's really important that nothing has any sort of wiggle to it at all. Everything needs to be really just sort of locked into place. And so I'm going to mix up a bunch of epoxy resin and I'm just going to smother everything I make in resin so it all locks together very firmly. And then instead of making sort of a, a T uh, for the for the crochet, I'm making kind of a triangle. And this is kind of standard for when you're doing any sort of relief. Uh, it's just going to be a frame that sits well above the the work itself, and you can attach the the pointing machine to any part of this crochet. Notice that all the joints of the crochet are also slathered with resin, so nothing has any sort of wiggle whatsoever. All of the painstaking effort to make sure the frame doesn't move is how you make sure you get extremely accurate reproductions of your statues. I'm going to take a point right off the eyelid, or at the center of the eyelid. Once the needle is locked into place, I just slide it down until it touches the surface of the cast. I look at that point very carefully, I slide the needle back, and I make a little tiny pencil mark directly where the needle touches the cast. Then all I need to do is pick up the entire apparatus, the crochet with the, with the pointing machine, and I place it into the three holes on the marble and I slide the needle back down until it touches the stone. Then I'm going to make three lines. And there's the magic. By being able to move your measuring device from the original to the reproduction, you can measure the reproduction in a very accurate way and with a skilled craftsman eventually make a very accurate reproduction. If you have fixed reference points and a frame that do not move. And that's where I think the nubs came in. I think the nubs were a fixed reference point for a framework like this, perhaps even a place for them to secure them to. Now they didn't have things like that sliding needle that they could use to measure things super accurately like they could in the Renaissance and whatnot, but they could use a stick and, the same, and effectively do the same thing. They just had to change the stick as depths changed and whatnot. But as far as getting the general shape and the general framework, this would absolutely work. But in order to do this, you would have to plan it out carefully because you're not working from an original, right? You're working to make something that's fitting a preconceived idea. So in my opinion, this is how they would go about it. First, they would draw out their plan on the ground. This is how we're going to make this megalithic structure. It's all drawn out on the dirt. Then they go through and they mark each one of these points and they measure all this out. They decide how each rock's going to be. They build a framework, a very stable framework, for each stone in that whole mess. They go to a piece of stone that's going to be used for one of these rocks. They carve it down a few inches so that they've got two nubs and a flattened surface. They build a frame around those two nubs and affix that frame to the larger framework. So now that large frame that basically plots out the exterior of this entire stone is bonded to those two nubs. So anytime you pick up that framework to carve and you want to put it back down to check, it's going to fit perfectly exactly the same way as long as you made sure that the framework doesn't move. 
to, you still have to make sure that part's done, but those stone nubs, they ain't going nowhere. So in my opinion, this is what they were used for. And I know this isn't the most exciting explanation. It sure as hell isn't as fun as electricity spitting out of the things. But this would explain why they show up with just dummy accurate masonry because this is how they, they would be making dummy accurate masonry. This is a method of making it so accurate you create reproductions. Now obviously this is attributing a higher level of technology to a lot of these ancient cultures than mainstream academia would say that they have. But I still do believe that this is the best explanation for a lot of what we see. These really accurate stone walls that have these nubs, this explains how they would make those really accurate stones. I mean, that's long and short of it, right? Now, I know that this doesn't explain everything, but this does explain a lot of different stone artifacts from back in those days. I mean, a lot of them. As a matter of fact, one of the more enigmatic ones makes me feel like you know there's there's a um, a couple of things that it feels like I've got a, a handle on thanks to uh, all of this. Our subject here is a stone vase from ancient Egypt carved from a single block of igneous granite. We examined the lug handles in the last video. They were some of the most remarkable features on the vase itself. So when we start with the very top of the vase this is where we decided to build our geometric coordinate system. Adam Young, the guy I was talking about before, he's got a vase that's really nice, and it was it's the provenance on it is is perf is, is impeccable. When this objection on provenance comes from mainstream archaeologists, as I saw it did, I find the hypocrisy to be, to be utterly, utterly palpable. palpable. So now we have a coordinate system on the top, leveled to the top and exactly in the center of where that cylinder is. And when it comes to any objection or coherent responses to this data, it's been radio silence. Hi.